about some first catch centers. Um, since it's spring, all the first catch centers that are out there are in full swing, getting prepared to um, have their trailers up and ready for summer, spring and summer activities. So I just kind of want to give a quick overview of what a first catch center is, how it benefits a state, and show you some state examples. So the concept of a first catch center started because there's currently no, <coughs> excuse me, no organized effort to foster participation in recreational fishing and boating like other groups have. There is, um, baseball has Little League, pro, um, football has Pop Warner, golf has First Tee, all to provide multiple times for uh, a kid to come and learn more about the sport, get coached, get some mentoring. But there was really nothing like this for fishing. Um, and urban fishing programs are vital as they bring fishing experiences directly to growing populations of Americans. They increase, and they also increase access to fishing opportunities. There can be a lot of fishing available right at people's doorsteps and they might not know it until you tell them that they can fish there. And so it's essential to introduce fishing to inner city multicultural audiences as a fun way to spend time with family and friends. This is an example of North Carolina's first catch center that they had at a recent event. So the whole goal is to provide the hands-on opportunities to where kids and families can learn basics of fishing boat or boating skills, um, along with conservation ethics. One of the things that we ask our partners to who have a first catch center trailer to do is to host at least eight events throughout the year. This provides kids and families to Go to multiple go to multiple fishing events, learn more about fishing, hone their skills so that they can eventually do it on their own without the necessary needed support. Here's a list of the locations where we currently have first catch centers. Um, majority of them are trailers. The first catch center trailer, um, New Jersey actually has a fixed location. So to get each mobile trailer up and running, RBFF provides about $25,000 to the partner managing the program. And so these funds are used to actually acquire the trailer, wrap it in the first catch center branding that you can see in the picture there, um, and wrap it in the first catch center branding, but also the state agency and partner logos that, are, that you want to show, um, and all the necessary equipment and supplies. Uh, this is a picture of Wisconsin that their first catch center went to an ice fishing event that they had. So we will um, also are happy to work with you to get some of the unique equipment that your state might need that not every, every state would, would have or be necessary. So these are just a few of examples of the benefits that states have received from first catch centers. I'm not going to go into them as um, we have two more speakers to talk about them firsthand. Um, so after this, if you have questions, um, myself or Eric Wilson are in the audience, and um, after these presentations, we'll take Q&A, but you can contact either one of us if you have future questions about the First Catch Centers. So I'd actually now like to introduce our next two presenters. Um, first, we have Kim Sullivan, the Aquatic Resource Education Coordinator with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. She'll share with you why she and her partners wanted to be a part of the First Catch Center program and the work that they've done on it to date. We'll also then hear from Chris Campo. He is the fish and wildlife biologist with the DC Department of Energy and Environment. Um, they've had a mobile First Catch Center up and running for a few years now. So he'll share with you some of the work they've done, successes they've had, benefits, and where they're taking their First Catch Center later this year. So we, um, after they both present, we will I'll come back up onto the stage for, um, for Q&A so we can help answer any questions by all of us at that time. So, Kim? All right, thank you to Joanne and RBFF. Uh, today I have the opportunity to talk about Rhode Island's highly anticipated first catch center, uh, which was actually initiated, unlike other states, by our national refuge system here in Rhode Island. And the sole intent was to increase statewide fishing opportunities uh, in collaboration with Rhode Island DEM, or Department of Environmental um, Management, which is me, and the Partnership for Providence Parks. All right, so let's talk about Rhode Island. Um, we are the smallest state in the union. 
Uh, most of you probably recognize us by a uh, black dot right next to Connecticut, right above New York, uh, and a line with us in the Atlantic Ocean. So that's us. We have about 1.1 million people, um, but because we're so small, we are the second most highly urbanized state in the union. Um, as you can see on the map, the majority of our population is in the northeast corner, and that's Providence, our main center. It's quite ethnically diverse. Um, however, despite our size and the urbanization, uh, we do boast lots of freshwater and saltwater resources, and we have 384 miles of coastline, so pretty significant. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about the different challenges that all of us as state agencies have to endure. And Rhode Island's no different. Uh, we have staffing shortages, budget shortages. Um, but some of the major challenges I've kind of identified here. Uh, one of those is that, as we said, we're the smallest state. Uh, we also have a 1.1 million people. And that competition for their attention for fishing is intense. Uh, so, you know, we have all these great activities and organizations here in Rhode Island, um, but we are vying for that same constituency. Um, and 1.1 million people is not a lot of people. Um, also, uh, our urban centers are continually uh, shifting towards a more diverse culture. Uh, language barriers are rising, and where I am, we're in the middle of Exeter, in the middle of the woods, Arcadia management area. Uh, where the population is, is Providence, complete different uh, places. So we're always trying to strive to find ways and unique ways to overcome those language barriers, those cultural differences. Um, finally, and you guys are all going to laugh at this, uh, but uh, one of our greatest challenges is that of travel barriers. We are 45 minutes long, 35 minutes wide. Um, however, a large portion of our residents either cannot get there due to public transit issues or they just do not want to travel. Uh, so Rhode, Island's, Rhode Islanders generally stay within a 20 minute circumference from where they live. Um, some of us, you know, really adventurous people will go 30 minutes away. True story. <laughs> So part of my job, as well as all of ours here at state agencies, is to overcome these challenges. And with Rhode Island, uh, one of the ways that we have actually done it is by creating a really strong partnership uh, with many agencies, but in specifically talking about our uh, Rhode Island, uh, sorry, Yost Fish and Wildlife Service National Refuge System. Um, and basically, the fish, all right, just want to make sure I was on the right page, sorry. <laughs> um, and those strong partnerships have allowed us to obtain this uh, first catch center uh, coming to Rhode Island. All right, so today, focusing on the strength of building the partnership and why it's important is uh, one of our strongest partnerships began over 20 years ago when U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Natural, National Refuge System invited DEM to participate in their Take Me Fishing Day. Pretty much DEM, we brought the gear, we brought the expertise. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service provided the venue. Uh, we had the fishing activities as well as volunteers. Uh, so it's kind of a match made in heaven. We each had value added on both sides. Um, over the time, that partnership actually grew to include specialty fly fishing programs together, cops and bobbers, as well as fishing programs in association with the Latino Conservation Week. Um, we discovered during all of these programs that we had a very successful partnership simply because we had like-minded goals, we were creative, reliable, and really flexible. So build Go back, there we go. So building on that success, uh, even furthermore and expanding that, in 2013, the partnership between Rhode Island DEM and the refuge system expanded into the creation of their Provident, sorry, uh, Providence Parks Urban Wildlife Partnership, which allowed the state's aquatic resource education program to train Providence teachers, an underserved population, in environmental curricula such as Project Wild and Project Wet, as well as 
providing busing to get Providence students down to our Kettle Pond Visitor Center. And why this is important to mention is because of that urban wildlife partnership, we were able to pilot a Cops and Bobbers uh, program with partnership for Providence Parks, which snowballed into them going ahead and applying for the BAMOS Office Scott Grant. So I, I'm very lucky. I have a couple of people who were not able to make it uh, today. So I'm going to turn the floor over to my partners and uh, they are going to be, April specifically is going to be talking about how Providence Parks uh, was successful with the Bob Masafa SCAR programming and how they see the first catch center actually rolling into their mission. Hi there, my name is April Alex and I am the program coordinator for our Urban Wildlife Refuge Partnership here in Providence. This urban partnership was established through a memorandum of agreement with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, the City of Providence's Parks Department, and a nonprofit called the Partnership for Providence Parks. Our overall mission is to connect our Providence residents and visitors to nature using city parks and neighborhoods and urban green spaces as outdoor learning areas where people can come to play and relax and explore. And we've been collaborating with many partners throughout the state over the past 10 years to do just this, including the fabulous Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. But one of our most successful public programs has been our Vamos a Pescar Take Me Fishing series. And this idea really began after hosting some public fishing programs with Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. And they suggested that we try for the George H.W. Bush Vamos a Pescar Education Fund. So through a collaborative proposal, we planned three to four different fish education or fishing programs throughout the entire summer. And the goal was to uh, engage our urban uh, residents that are living in and around our urban areas, uh, while also specifically welcoming Hispanic and Latino families through our bilingual events. It was important for us to address some of the barriers that we have here in Providence, while also leaning into our many assets throughout the city and state. So in addition to addressing that language barrier, as uh, Providence itself has about 43% of our city residents identifying as Hispanic and Latino, uh, we also wanted to make sure that we increased access to things like just fishing equipment uh, and opportunities to fish. We also wanted to remove the transportation barriers by providing free busing to and from our many events. Uh, and we also offered paid opportunities for bilingual youth leaders to not only gain valuable skills related to fishing, but also the chance to teach these to their members of their community. So through our valuable partnerships, uh, including one that we have with the Hispanic Access Foundation, our bilingual interns are hired from within the Providence community, and they help to lead these events, whereby they really welcome families through what we call stepping stones of engagement. And the way they do this is by providing fishing programs that start within a city park, then we visit a place like a state park, and then we finally culminate in an offshore fishing adventure. So with the addition of this uh, mobile first catch center, we look forward to expanding these programs beyond our current sites to not only include more fishing access out along many of our saltwater and fresh waterways within urban areas, but also to additional areas throughout the state. And by providing this type of equipment access, we can immerse our families in connecting to nature all over the state of Rhode Island. And we hope to help them to create these lasting, positive, wonderful memories together along the way. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, April was hoping to get here. However, her husband went and scheduled a tour of Canada. So uh, we did get her this way. Uh, also, we have Janice, the person who was very responsible for initiating the first catch center here in Rhode Island. She's part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Rhode Island Refuge System, and she's shared a few words with us as well. Hi there, I'm Janice Nipchinski, the Visitor Services Manager for the National Wildlife Refuges of Rhode Island, as well as the Project Officer for the Providence Urban Partnership. I've been here at the refuges since 1999, and as you have heard since that time, we have worked together with our state partner, who's a value added partner, RITEM. Together we offer numerous fishing programs, especially the popular and annual Take Me Fishing Day. Over the years, almost over 20 years, Kimberly and our staff have partnered with additional service 
programs such as the North Attleboro National Fish Hatchery and the Services Federal Law Enforcement Division. Together as value partners, we share the collaborative work for fish conservation and protection. Specifically, the Services Hatchery brings their live truck to Take Me Fishing Day to showcase their conservation work and visitors get a chance to see fish close up, such as the brook trout and allies, while learning about their natural history at the same time. In addition, the Northeast National Fish Hatcheries also support items trout and salmon in the classroom programs in many schools throughout Rhode Island. Over the years, our joint fishing programs have grown to include additional partners, such as the Providence Urban Partnership, local towns, city park departments, local police departments, the National Park Service, and several NGOs. With these inspiring partnerships came the need to provide additional fishing programs at more locations and throughout the state, and two additional programs that are vital to reach in diverse audiences is the Vamos Apascar events and the Cops and Barbers program. However, this meant providing more fishing poles, both salt and freshwater, supplying additional fishing lures and bait, and much more, at more locations where they are needed. This is why having a first catch center trailer and the partnership with RBFF is vital to the Rhode Island fishing program. And as you know, fishing is a priority public use with the refuge system. And this trailer is coming to our state at the right time. We were fortunate to be asked if a first catch center trailer could support our joint fishing programs. And of course, Kimberly and myself answered absolutely yes. And since we were the first refuge in the Northeast for Fish and Wildlife Service to acquire this trailer, we worked with our regional office to, to develop a template for the agreement, knowing that other refuges could also use this and have the support of a first catch center trailer, which has been the case. So thank you much to all the folks in the regional office. The agreement also outlines how together we are providing additional outreach for our fishing programs. This way we can reach more families and get them hooked on fishing. Yes, the first catch center trailer and its equipment provides the resources we need to meet the current and expanded programs. But the trailer also serves as an education center where we can teach families about fish conservation and what they can do to help. With the first catch center trailers, we're able to spend our time reaching more families, dismantling barriers and get folks out fishing. We hope not to only get first time anglers, but also to provide support and resources so they can continue to fish and enjoy this traditional pastime for many years to come. Thank you and thank you, Kimberly. All right, so while they weren't able to be here in person, I know that they're, they've actually been texting to see how things are going. So uh, they are very engaged. Um, so I want to say thank you to Alex, or, sorry, April, Alex, and Jan Sopchinski for, you know, contributing to the presentation. But now that you've heard uh, from all the partners involved in acquiring the Rhode Island's first catch center, I just wanted to share some updates. First off, First of all, um, I'm happy to announce that our trailer should be either in Maryland or heading to Maryland today as we speak. Uh, then it's going to travel about a mile down the road and get wrapped. I believe Maryland is getting theirs as well, either today, something like that. Um, and then uh, once, it, once we have it here in Rhode Island, we'll be stocking it with both uh, freshwater and saltwater fishing equipment. So we'll be able to do both service in the entirety of Rhode Island. The good news is that, um, that we've, what we've done is we've already established programming for the trailer. Uh, we were, have minimum staff in both the DEM, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Providence Parks. So we needed to integrate it into already established programming and then 
add more as the year goes on. So already established programming that we're hoping to uh, host with it is the Vamos Scott, Scott Crafts and Bobbers, the saltwater fishing events, the Take Me Fishing events in both uh, Satros Point, which is saltwater, and then Kelly House up in Lincoln, which is uh, freshwater. Uh, those and the uh, National Park Service is actually the partner for that one. Uh, and then we have the uh, Newport Pit Kids Day. Uh, the advantage of having this is that uh, we're also going to be able to do pop-up events. Not only do we have these established ones, but we're already talking about hosting some fall events where we're, we'll be able to just say, hey, let's do this weekend and uh, grab that. So it, the First Catch Center allows us to do that. All right, so one of the things they said is like, what kind of advice can you offer? And I'm here like, we don't even have the trailer yet. But, you know, I'm thinking, you know, as I, I'm sitting there and pondering the question, um, we do have some advice. The first thing for us was, it was super important to create that strong partnership. Uh, you know, effective partners are those who are flexible and reliable and realistic in what they can actually bring to the table. That's either gear, um, it's staff, so on and so forth. Second, and uh, I believe uh, I was talking to Dave, uh, he had even mentioned how long it took for this agreement to get through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and then, oh yeah, Rhode Island Legal. Um, so it does take a while for these uh, agreements to be processed and get, get through into the different um, partners. Uh, third, figure out the logistics beforehand, from who's registering and transporting the trailer to who is selecting the equipment. Uh, be sure you have all your ducks in the row because that process will go quickly once the trailer is a reality. And finally, uh, for us, we, as I said before, do not reinvent the wheel. There is limited staff all around in Rhode Island, um, and we have other responsibilities apart from creating fishing events. Uh, so to make the First Catch Center work, we had to integrate it into already planned partner programming. And this gives us a little bit of latitude to create additional uh, programs, pop-up events in our urban areas across the way. We're super excited for the trailer and I want to thank RBFF for that. Uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Chris from DC, who is, if you want to be a reality, we would be third most urbanized state if we counted Washington, D.C., so not right, quite, so. not quite. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Great job. All right, I just want to say thank you, Joanne, for the introduction, and well done, Kimberly. It's all good and move forward here. All right, so today I want to talk about some of our experiences in Washington, D.C. Um, with our Mobile First Catch Center and some of the wonderful partnerships um, that we have been able to make as a result of having that trailer. So uh, before I really get into that, I do um, I want to talk briefly about the history of the trailer, sort of the when, the why, the how, um, as to how we got it, how it came to be, um, and some of sort of the immediate tangible benefits of having it as well. So that picture, by the way, is from downtown Tidal Basin. I think, Dave, you may have actually taken that picture. <laughs> I should have a little credit there. All right, so a brief history here. Um, when, uh, we, were, we were approached in late 2020, um, actually by Dave at the time, um, and the timeline-wise, we, 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 we had a completed trailer delivered and operational within about six months of that, so by, by mid-April 2021. Um, but the why, so RBFF had additional funding um, following sort of the initial trailer rollout. I wanna say it was about 10 states, is that right? Um, and you know, the District of Columbia sort of is a textbook urban fishery. Um, so we, we sort of fit the bill in that regard. Um, how? Uh, we've worked directly with RBFF, a regional uh, trailer distributor, uh, DOE's Office of Communications, Engagement, and Outreach. I want to give a quick shout out to Tani Simon. She is from our uh, OCEO. Um, a graphics specialist, and, and we all coordinated, you know, on the purchasing, custom wrapping, and pickup of this awesome trailer. So that's sort of a little, a little background there. Um, benefits. In one word, uh, the trailer has been a game changer for us. So prior to having um, this incredible piece of hardware, the closest thing to a mobile first catch center that we had would be the truck bed of an F-350. So uh, as you can imagine, it's a little messier when you're throwing rods and reels and tackle boxes in the truck bed. We, now we have this, this wonderful thing. Um, 
So a little bit about the Mobile First Catch Center, and again, I know many states have them now, some do not. Um, in short, it's modular, rapidly deployable, um, it has all of your necessary tackle in one place. Um, and I wanna note that RBFF actually provided us with specifically what we needed. I know Joanne touched upon that earlier. So they will work with you to get you specifically what you need uh, for your circumstances. Um, I wanna note too that RBFF worked again with our Office of Communications, Engagement and Outreach uh, to ensure that our trailer wrap and graphics are representative of the community they serve. So we'll get to see some pictures here in a little bit. Uh, I'll note this presentation is a little text heavy on the front end, but there are plenty of great pictures on the back end. Um, I, I wanna note that mobile first catch centers across the board, they're all encompassing. They have it all in one place. Um, and that makes collaborative events really, really appealing to prospective uh, partners. So I wanna note too that we have a staff of two educational biologists. I am one of them at the moment. Um, so it allows our very small staff to scale our reach considerably, I would even say exponentially. So it has truly been a game changer for us. So a little bit about partnerships. Um, we work with nonprofit entities, federal government, local government, et cetera. And more often than not, they do have sort of the desire to work together on fishing events, but they don't necessarily have the gear or maybe the know-how. They have the people, but maybe not the gear or the know-how. So again, having um, this, this incredible, incredible centerpiece, right, the Mobile First Catch Center, it helps us cement partnerships. Um, it really does bridge the gap between a lot of organizations. And again, they just they don't have the gear, maybe they don't have the know-how, um, but they do have the desire to work together. Uh, so for us, our planning phase begins in Q2, early Q2, so we're kind of almost more or less done with our planning phase now. Um, and we reach out to past and potential new partners, um, and we secure weekend fishing dates on a first come, first serve basis. So for us, most of our fishing dates are gonna be on generally Saturdays, Sundays, mostly Saturdays. It's what works for us. Um, we're talking sort of a four to six month lead time, and that allows for all necessary planning, permitting, and promotion. And I wanna note that uh, permitting wise, so in the District of Columbia, the National Park Service actually owns much of the accessible shoreline. So we do have to do some permitting on that end, and that does take a little time. Uh, the majority of our events occur in Q3 and Q4, so that's gonna be April through September on our end. So who do we work with? Um, at the federal level, the National Park Service, we're hoping to work with NOAA in 2023, so we'll see how that goes. Um, at the local level, the Metropolitan Police Department, so MPD, that's DC Police, um, District of Columbia Public Schools, and then a variety of nonprofits, most of which are envir environmental, but not all of them. So we've got sort of a nice list up here. And these are all partners that we actually have worked with or have events planned with at the moment. So I, I wanna highlight a few uh, noteworthy partnerships, um, one of which, or rather two of which occurred during National Fishing and Boating Week uh, 2022. So our agency uh, partnered up with the National Park Service, the National Park Trust, and the National Park Foundation, and of course, some wonderful folks from RBFF were there too. Um, and we hosted not one, but two uh, Junior Ranger ASL Angler events. Um, again, during National Fishing and Boating Week 2022. And these events were tailored uh, toward the local deaf community. So the National Park Service actually hired ASL translators uh, for these events. Uh, National Park Trust actually provided uh, spinning combos for the kids to actually take home when they were done. So every kid had the opportunity to take home a combo. And then the National Park Foundation provided some funding as well there. Um, these were first of their kind events. They definitely made waves at the National Park Service, you know, the Department of Interior broadly. Um, and they were so popular, we actually hosted an encore event in September uh, 2022. And I would note that one kid did, in fact, catch a 21-pound blue catfish, so pretty cool. And we've, got a, we've got a picture of that later on, don't worry. Uh, moving forward, uh, an, another sort of noteworthy partnership, um, we worked directly with uh, Metropolitan Police Department, their criminal apprehension unit, um, and we hosted spring and fall uh, fishing trips at their Harbor Patrol headquarters. Uh, again, the kids caught a lot of fish, had a ton of fun, we also worked with Code 3 Association, so they work with uh, sort of like local police and fire entities, right, and they generously provided lunch uh, for these outings. I should note the fish on the left there is actually an 18 pound blue catfish, so blue cats and bluegills are kind of our, our bread and butter for a lot of the, the kids' fishing programs. Um, fish on the right was maybe like 10 pounds or so, but not bad, you know, by, by kids' fishing trip standards, so. Another uh, set of noteworthy partnerships, um, we provided our first full moon night fishing activity on the Anacostia River um, in, in August uh, 2022, and this was partnered with uh, Living Classrooms Foundation. So they're actually a grantee of ours, but we do a ton of work with them on the environmental ed front. 
Um, we also worked with uh, Cub Scouts and PAC 230s, so that's the National Capital Area Council, and we did spring and fall fishing trips as well. So I had a ton of fun on that end. Um, and I'll, uh, this is gonna be a little anachronous here. I'm gonna jump back a bit to 2021 and then we'll flash forward to 2022. So I know this presentation is mostly about partnerships. Um, at the time, we were fully staffed in 2021. So what we did was more of a standalone approach. Um, and we had a 12 event series, Q3, Q4. So two events per month, April through September, um, various locations throughout the district. We try to focus on the Anacostia River Corridor. So in the district, we have the Potomac and the Anacostia. The Anacostia is sort of like America's other river that most folks don't really know about. Um, it does have a legacy of environmental pollution, frankly, environmental racism. So that's, that's really the corridor that we focus on primarily, sort of the underserved um, wards of the district, mostly Ward 7, Ward 8. Um, we attracted nearly 400 attendees across these 12 events. Um, and I've just got some nice pictures there. So starting from the top left, that's actually Anacostia Park. My office is located there. I love the little white perch right there. You can kind of see our, our tent set up there, and I know we've probably seen some other states at this point too, but we love it. Um, again, a glimpse of the trailer there on the right, and that was actually at the Tidal Basin, the May 2021 event. Um, bottom right corner, a group of kids over at Diamond Teague Park. Um, and again, we, we, we love the little foam uh, bass cutouts that you sent us, Dave. Definitely need more of those. Um, and then there's a bullhead catfish over at Kingman Island on the Anacostia River. So again, awesome event series. We really got solid turnout and had a lot of fun. But moving forward to 2022, that's really where we were down uh, staff, we were understaffed, and we really had no choice but to partner with a lot of, uh, or a variety of organizations, federal government, local government, nonprofits. Um, so top left corner, that's actually from our Encore uh, September sort of Junior Ranger ASL Angler event at the Tidal Basin, again, right downtown. If you all are familiar with the sort of the Cherry Blossom Festival, that's right there. And yes, there are fish in there. It's a question we get a lot. Um, and actually sort of top center there, that is a 21 pound blue catfish uh, that one of our kids caught at that event. Um, to the right, we've got a casting activity. So everyone loves backyard bass, we do too. So we've got the zip code dock demons and that was again a scout group at Fletcher's Cove in Northwest DC. Uh, bottom right corner, group shot from, uh, I believe that was our fall fishing trip. Um, with MPD's Criminal Apprehension Unit. And again, we worked with a, uh, a local public charter school uh, to get those kids out there. And then lastly, a photo from Diamond Teague Park um, during one of our early May events there. And again, we, we had 14 events, Q1 through Q4, mostly Q3, Q4 for the most part, um, seven locations throughout the district. And again, we got about 450 attendees across all events. So looking ahead, um, I have a small list of events we have lined up. I should note that since I submitted these slides, we actually have additional events lined up, so this is not even fully accurate. You'll, you'll get the full, uh, the full list, Joanne and Eric, if you're here as well, so um, I'll make sure to keep you all posted. But yeah, we have quite a lot lined up. Um, the first event there on April 23rd, Haynes Point Community Day, that's in partnership with the National Park Service. Um, we're doing a shad fishing outing at Fletcher's Cove on April 29th, and this is with Howard University and HBCU, uh, the National Park Trust, and again, the National Park Service. We do have some fishing days lined up with the local public charter school. Again, we're working, uh, partnering with the National Park Trust on that one. That'll be at Kingman Island on the Anacostia River. Um, I have another shad fishing outing lined up with National Park Trust and the National Park Service on May 20th. Um, this is interesting. This is sort of our first foray into working with military families. So Joint Base uh, Meyer Henderson Hall will be sending some families over to, to come fishing with us. So really excited about that. Um, I mentioned we do have another spring fishing trip lined up. And then lastly, a big one, still working on the permitting right now, but um, every year there's an organization called TAPS. It's the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. Some of you may be familiar, others may not. Um, they work with you know, Gold Star families, the families that have lost service members. Um, and every year they have a, a National Military Survivor Seminar, but part of that includes the Good Grief Camp. So that is a camp for the actual kids, right? And these are survivors. So, we're working to, uh, to put together a pretty fun day of fishing uh, downtown at the Tidal Basin. So there's more to come on this end. And again, this is already not quite accurate. So, you know, this will expand um, as certainly as the year progresses here. Um, I wanna note that our BFF can make this happen for your agency. So I, again, I know there are roughly 20 some odd states that either have a trailer or will have a trailer here soon. But again, it's, it's doable. I'm probably one of the younger folks here. I mean, I, I can assure you, the paperwork is probably the hardest part, right? But they will work with you. They will get you what you need. Um, and 
honestly, probably within six months time, you, you can have a trailer of your own and be fully operational. So we're tremendously thankful for that. Dave, I know you were a huge part of that early on, so we can't thank you enough. And lastly, I just wanted to include my contact info up there. We can kind of do some Q&A. So I'll hand it back over to Joanne here. Thank you. Yep. Do we have any questions for Kimberly, Chris, or myself? No? Okay. Well, thank you both very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.